And one of my favorite authors, Juno Diaz. Um, he's the author of The Brief Wondrous Life of Oscar Wilde, which is a Pulitzer Prize winning novel from a couple years ago. And this is one of the things that he says when he talks about reading. He says it's one of the practices that brings you into very close sustained contact with another's nervous system. One of the few places where we can spend, depending on how fast you read, a couple hours, a couple days, a couple weeks, a couple months, in very direct contact with another person. And I think what he's trying to get to when he says that is that reading is one of the few activities that we do where you can actually be immersed in someone else's thinking for hours at a time. Right? It's one thing to watch a movie, it's a couple hours. Right? That's good. You can develop empathy from watching a movie. You absolutely can. But a movie's not going to challenge your imagination the same way that reading does. Right? Because a movie's going to put images up there for you that some director decided should be there. Right? When you're reading print on a page, it's all about your imagination. And you have to be able to smell the smells that are talked about. You have to be able to see the sights that are described. Right? And you can spend hours and hours in a book. Most of us who are teachers, I'm sure, know what that feels like. But a lot of our students really don't. You know, outside of Harry Potter, maybe Twilight, Hunger Games, whatever, a lot of them really don't. And if they don't, how are they developing empathy? Do we really want generations of future people in this country, especially boys, who are not empathetic? I think we see the result of that already in our political landscape. When we have so many policies, that are about taking away from people their health care, their safety nets. When we see males in the political landscape trying to tell us what women should be doing with their contraceptive choices, I think we're talking about males who don't have a lot of empathy. Right? And I'm sorry to be political, but that's just how I am, so I can't help it. Um, I think it's a real disaster for us. If we are not talking to our young males and trying to encourage them to read, so I think we are going to experience an empathy deficit if we don't continue them to read. That's my thought. Speaking of empathy, one of the things I like to do when I'm feeling like I'm not really empathetic toward people, and I kind of feel like I'm not really a very like, warm person like Stan is, so I try to write my way into feeling other people. And that seems to really help me. So I thought I would share another poem with you. Um, I'm trying to do a series of poems called the Dudes Series which means that I'm writing about other males that I don't understand and what happens when I come into contact with them, what they think about me and what I think about them. So this, I grew up on the East Coast. We don't really have these um, sort of indoor water parks on the East Coast, but I went to one with my kids a couple years ago. Um, so this is about that. And I know it's late in the day, but you guys can feel free to like, you know, enjoy the poem if you want to. This is called, Dude, we encounter as we float down the lazy river. <clears throat> My son pushes the two-person inner tube at the water park, attached to the overpriced hotel. And it's not really called the lazy river, but Caribou Creek, as if we're not spending Thanksgiving in Sandusky, Ohio, but Manitoba, with the hoary ancestral clan hunting grouse and, if we're lucky, moose. But Julius, only five, knows better. So lazy river it is. And I'm the lazy one. Blissfully so. Overjoyed not to be chasing him up rope ladders through the tree fort as an unholy bucket of cold water drenches my shivering shoulders or carrying another two-person tube up the steep stairs so my daughter and I can shoot like BBs through an excessive writhing slide knot. In the lazy river, it's chill time. I'm soaking up my five days off from lesson plans and pleas to stop texting after the bell. And even though kids are shrieking and the smell of chlorine is overwhelming and the lifeguard is watching everything sharp-eyed like an armed border sentry still, I can unbend as my son stands in 84 degree water up to his neck and pushes me gently through my slow, slow, Vacation walls, my fingers a warm brush through the liquid soothe and sway until our progress is impeded by a bald dude with a porn star mustache and a gut like a tremendous platter of pastrami. And he's relaxing too 
and navy blue swing trunks, his legs hanging over the side of his tube, and my arms hanging over the side of my tube, and amidst our reveries, we collide ever so briefly, and I touch his toe. This is the kind of thing that typically enrages me. Like, what the heck is this fat ass toe doing in the middle of the lazy river when I'm just trying to bond a little with my son? When I'm just trying to chill, to find a sliver of easy in my crazy radio static life. All I'm asking is for some peace, a few small measures of serenity. And now I gotta deal with this dude's disgusting toe? <laughs> Except his toe feels soft. The sweet, happy flesh of it, like the kind of hammock I can imagine napping in. And I don't know what kind of shape my normally, clank, normally cranky face takes, but the man grins like, isn't it the silliest thing? Here's my toe, and you touched it. And it felt okay, right? <laughs> it felt okay for sure. And here we are in a fake river, in an overpriced hotel. And I don't know you, and you don't know me, and we're two dudes who would probably flip each other off on the highway, but you touched my toe, and I'm all right with that. I'm all right with that, and you're all right with it too, aren't you? Thank you. So, I mean, for me, like I said, I think reading and writing is the thing that brings me closer to other people. And since I started writing poetry maybe 20 years ago, I feel like I'm a much better human being. And I think that's probably true for my, most of my students too. The more they read, the more they write, the more they become aware of the other people around them and how important it is to try to understand them and understand their stories. And we've heard a lot today about that, about everybody's voice mattering in the classroom, right? But it's one thing for teachers to believe it, but how to get students to believe it too. And I think reading is really one of the secrets um, into that way of living and looking at the world. So why don't boys read? We do have some research about this. According to a survey conducted by the Young Adult Library Service Association, 39.3% say it's boring and no fun. 29.8% um, say, say they have no time or they're too busy. 11% might like other activities better, just can't get into the story, 7.7%. I'm not good at it, 4.3%. The thing is, I think that most of the time, we say this is why. We say young people don't, young boys don't like to read because they're just not good at reading. But you can see most of the boys are responding not having to do with that. They're not saying I'm a bad reader, right? They're just saying, I think boring, no fun, like other activities better, and can't get into the stories is pretty much all the same thing, right? So that's, again, close to 60% saying, I just don't really like it that much. It's not that interesting to me, right? So if it's not that interesting to them, I think as teachers, what we have to do is try and make it more interesting somehow, you know? And I think the thing is, the literature is out there, right? Um, so this is some of the things that you see on other websites. Guysread.com says things like, biologically, boys are slower to develop than girls and often struggle with reading and writing girls early on, skills early on. That may be true. And I think for elementary school teachers in here, that's probably really important to make sure to get boys reading you know, at, a, at a young age and help them uh, welcome them into reading. I think someone earlier said something about that and make your classroom feel welcoming. Um, like the, the doors at Target, right? Um, then the action-oriented competitive learning style of many boys works against them learning to read and write. I don't really get that. What does that really mean? Like, because they like to compete when they're learning, that means they don't want to read and write? Because last I saw they get graded, and I know in Poetry Slams, you know, we still have way more girls and boys competing. Um, I don't think the competitive learning style really has anything to do with it. Um, many books boys are asked to read don't appeal to them. They aren't motivated to want to read. That part, I think, is true. Um, also, we teach boys to suppress feelings. Boys are pressed, often don't feel comfortable enough exploring the emotions of feelings found in fiction. I think there's truth in that, but also, it's a myth. I think that sometimes people say, well, we've got to give boys nonfiction to read them because they'll be fine, they don't really like fiction. I, I find that not to be the case. Right? I think that if they like I think everybody likes stories. I mean, I think the human race does, right? Boys and girls. And if they have the right stories, I think they'll like fiction. I absolutely do think that. Um, I'll show you a little later uh, one of my students who said that he did because of that. 
Alright, um, I think this is also a really good point though here. Boys don't have enough positive male, ro male role models for literacy. The majority of adults involved in kids reading are women. Boys might not see reading as a masculine activity. That part I think is true. I think I'm one of, um, I don't know how many high school English teachers in this district who are male, but it's definitely the minority, right, compared to the female ones. And I don't think that that necessarily means that that's why boys don't read, but I think if they don't see their they're a male in their household reading, if they don't have an, an English teacher that's male, if they just don't ever see a male interested in reading, that could be a problem. So I do think there's some truth to that particular um, notion. So what can we do? Um, I think what we need to do really is fight for boys, you know, at this point to say, okay, how can we infuse books into the curriculum that is really going to help them and get them excited about reading? I also want to say, though, Girls are not safe, I don't think, either. I think that even though girls do like to read for the most part now, it may not always be that way. And I think our educational policy that's moving away from, you know, lots of interesting fiction and poetry in the curriculum and more like, let's put some nonfiction in there and those kind of things. I don't think girls are going to be protected just because they supposedly like reading. You know, I think that we also need to find literature that girls are going to really like too because they're going to face the same um, temptations that boys face to be playing video games or going on Facebook, Facebook or whatever instead of actually sitting down and reading books. So I think it's really important that we advocate for everybody to want to read a lot, um, to advocate for reading time in our schools. I mean, when I look around the media center here, there's books in this library, but it's not like the kind of library I remember to when I was growing up, you know, where books are everywhere. And I know that in some ways it's a fading technology and we need to do everything else with, uh, you know, other forms of media, but at the same time, we need to make sure our students are reading books. I think we do. Um, so the number one I think we do, we first just have to reject the notion that boys don't like reading. I think we just have to say that's not true. All right? We can't start there. We have to start from a place that says boys do like reading. Because if we don't reach them, we're giving them something that they don't want to be reading. Right? I think that we do have to believe that they like reading. I make the same argument, by the way, for a lot of African American students in my school and students of color, and really students from all different ethnicities now. Um, there are a lot of students um, that will spend most of their lunch time reciting rhymes to each other, right, in, in hip hop form or whatever, and then they go in after lunch and fail their English class, right? And to me, that means as teachers, we're doing something wrong because those kids are already exhibiting some kind of love for language, some kind of interest in the written and spoken word, why isn't our English curriculum speaking to them? Right? I think we need to speak to them better so that they will be interested. Right? So I think number one thing we have to do, reject the notion that boys don't like reading. Number two, we must reject the notion that boys don't like reading poems and stories. We can't say, oh, they do like to read, but let's just keep giving them nonfiction. They'll like to read about the Navy SEALs, or they'll like to read about, um, you know, uh, how the first Corvette was built. They might, but they also like poems and stories, if we give them the right ones. They might not like Emily Dickinson, but that doesn't mean they don't like poetry, right? They might not like a Shirley Jackson story, that doesn't mean they don't like fiction, right? Um, so we must, third thing I think, we must offer the boys poems and stories that appeal to them, but don't pander to stereotypes, right? We don't have to say, okay, then we have to give you the story where everything blows up. Because when I talk to males, it's not like we need the stories that are about, um, you know, violence or sports or something. They like those things, but that's just a backdrop. What they really want, just like what everyone else who reads really wants, they want to find out about the human condition. They want those interior struggles, what people go through. And that's what's compelling to them. You know, the backdrop is one thing, but what they want is really like good writing that addresses the human condition.